Welcome to Human Histories. God bless you all. God save the king. December 7th, 1941. A date which will live in infamy. It's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. He was haughty in his walk, rolling his eyes hither and thither. So the power of his proud spirit appeared in the movement of his body. He was indeed a lover of war, yet restrained in his action, mighty in counsel, gracious to supplicants and lenient to those who were once received into his protection. He was short of stature, with a broad chest and a large head. His eyes were small, his beard sprinkled with grey, and he had a flat nose and a swarthy complexion, showing the evidence of his origin. And though his temper was such that he always had great self-confidence, yet his assurance was increased by finding the sword of Mars, always esteemed sacred among the kings of the Scythians, Priscus, on Attila the Hun. A couple quick ways to support the podcast. Follow us at Human Histories Podcast on all of our socials, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook. Donate to Patreon at Human Histories Podcast. And send us emails at humanhistoriespodcast at gmail.com. That's the best way, honestly. Shoot us emails on anything we missed, any um, questions you have or, or things that we could have done better. And this is the Human Histories Podcast. I'm your host, Riley Osborne, with my co-host, Ashton Myers. And let's get right into it. All right. So, uh, tell the Hun. We kind of covered uh, the Huns in our last episode, and we talked about um, how they were, you know... Um, civilized barbarians i guess you could say and this applied to attila of course he wasn't a uh, a wolf born bush baby that you know was came out of his mother ferocious and thirsting for blood in fact he he wasn't just an, a typical hun either he was the son of nobles um he had a privileged childhood uh, his father had passed away early on in his life so his two mentors were his uncles and they were the actually the joint rulers of the hunnic empire at this time ruga and Oktar. <clears throat> And they were the most powerful force north of the Danube River and pretty pretty fair ways east, right? So they covered an immense amount of land. Uh, the Hunnic Empire was actually, it, it was getting close to rivaling the Roman Empire in size, though in capability, it probably overcame the Roman Empire. Well, not probably, it definitely did. And we see that with how easily they dispatched the Romans uh, repeatedly. Um and, and this is where Attila comes into the story. So he, he was born into a situation where, you know, they were already whooping Rome's ass, right? And within within a couple of years of his birth, in fact, Alaric actually, the king of the Visigoths, had actually sacked Rome, right? So he grew up he grew up looking at the previous greatest empire and noticing how it fell and noticing its weaknesses and noticing where it could be exploited. And that's an important thing to remember later on in the story. But anyway, uh, we, we don't actually know the specific date of when Attila was born. And you guys are going to hear this repeated over and over and over again when it comes to ancient history. But we have two suspected dates, one of them being the late 4th century and the other being the early 5th century. And those specific dates are 395 AD or 406. AD. And so there's about a deviation of 10 years. Um, the big difference here with uh, his his dates is either how old he was when he died and how old he was when he accomplished some of the things he did. Um, either way, he did them. We're certain of that. We know that. We just don't know if he was a little bit more of a baby face or a little bit more of a grizzled man when he did. Um, and for, for a long time, it wasn't it wasn't just Attila. Growing up, he actually had his brother, Bleda, with him as well. Uh, he'll be briefly mentioned, but he's more of a side character. He's not nearly as important as the man, the myth, the legend himself, Attila the Hun. Um, and yeah, as we as we mentioned in the previous episode with the Hunnic people, they were they were on horses from the time they were toddlers, and you know, being the son of a noble. It was no different. You could actually say the expectation was greater. Uh, Attila and his brother, both from the age of probably three years old, were on horseback learning archery, uh, learning all the ins and outs of how to operate with this incredible animal and become one with it, right? Really become a lethal unit with it. Um, and these are just kind of little back, little backstory pieces of information that are that kind of give you guys a little bit of context as to who they were and why they were the way they were. Uh, lastly, and really. The only notable thing you could say about Attila's childhood before we move on to uh, the beginning of his reign 
is both him and his brother learned warfare and strategy from a very young age. So you'd have to imagine the benefit that that would pose being in the war room or in the case of the Huns, in the circle of horses, listening to all your elders and your father and your uncles and all the experienced people of your empire discussing how they're going to go and, you know, subjugate some more people. So you kind of get a feel for that, that, that martial lifestyle, the, the lifestyle of a war. You, you become no stranger to it. In fact, you're molded in it. Uh, and last but not least, probably something that could be overlooked as, oh, well, it's just a language, but something that's actually incredibly important is it's speculated that Attila and his brother both knew how to speak Gothic and Latin. So you could imagine while he's conquering these people, um, he doesn't need to rely on a third party translator, somebody who, you know, can misinform or misinterpret what he's trying to say or get across to the people that he's trying to subjugate. No, he can directly communicate with the people he's dealing with, either Roman or Goth. And uh, yeah, I, I, like Riley, could, could you imagine like, imagine running a business and, you know, you, you have you have different divisions, right? And you have like a French division, or like a, I don't know, a Spanish division, but and you have complex orders to give to them. But yet you have to go through like this, like 18 year old intern who just graduated high school. You know what I mean? Like, Well, man, a better example. I've literally worked with foreign countries in the military. So I know exactly what it's like to have, you know, English speakers and then Romanians and have to try to communicate with them. This would have been really important, knowing the languages of the people he was dealing with. And also, you got to remember that he, a lot of what Attila ends up doing is negotiation. So it, knowing the Roman and the Gothic languages was super important. And it, it'll, it'll show itself later as we see just how much negotiating he does. And that's actually a good entrance into how Belida and Attila started their reign. You know, after the passing of uh, Octar and Ruga, which was, it was th those were their uncles. We don't really know if Ruga didn't have any sons of his own or, or sort of why it was inherited to Attila and, and Belida. But we just know that that's who inherited it. The first thing they did was to go and, and sort of renegotiate with the Romans. And it's hard to say what the power dynamic between Attila and Belida was while they were co-rulers. Because like Ashton said, in history, we talk mostly about Attila himself. But for about 11 years, they ruled together. And we don't know if Attila was the king and Belida was sort of his, his right-hand man, or if they were co-rulers, or if they had split the Hunnic Empire and they each owned one, uh, ruled one side of the Hunnic Empire and then would, would talk together. But we know that it was actually Hunnic tradition to sort of have multiple kings and multiple rulers. It's just really difficult for us to pinpoint the power dynamic of what was going on and why they were co-ruling like this. And it's important to remember, uh, like we mentioned in the previous episode, the Huns weren't like it wasn't just like like the Romans in the sense of like we are the Roman people. Like you were a Hun, but maybe you were a Hun that belonged to Group A or Group B or Group C or Group D. You weren't. It wasn't an. It wasn't a complete amalgamation where you were under one banner, right? So it was a. It was. It was. I don't want to say tribal because I believe they were a bit more advanced than tribes, but they. They were, in a sense, a kind of a federation that said, okay, these are our rulers, these are the people we're going to follow, but there is still also independent contingents, contingents and detachments that could have operated independently. So so maybe, you know, maybe maybe Bleda was in control of a couple of these different detachments and Attila had the rest. We, we don't actually know. Yeah. Yeah, we don't actually know, and there's no way we'll ever really know. What we do know is that they worked together pretty simultaneously for, for a while. They actually had a good co-ruler um, business going on and the first thing they do is they renegotiate with the romans who were already paying them a sum of money that the that their uncles had sort of negotiated and it was a decent sum of money but i think that attila and his brother realized they could squeeze a bit more out of this massive roman empire and this this treaty is what was called the treaty of margus and this occurred in, in 435 so the romans were paying this massive sum 700 pounds of gold a year and they were also decreeing that they wouldn't enter any alliances with Hun enemies. They would also protect the Danube frontier from possible invaders. And sorry, that, that's what the Huns would do in return for the Romans. But I think it's insane to note that the biggest deal in this conversation, the biggest deal in this, um, like the biggest thing that was negotiated was the fact that the Huns just wouldn't attack the Romans. And the Romans were paying them 700 pounds of gold a year. So that begs the question, is this negotiation or is this extortion? What's really going on here? It, it's such an unbelievably one-sided deal in retrospect that I think it really shows how 
powerful the Huns are in comparison to the Romans at the time. I mean, look at it like this too, right? Like the fact that they, part of their, to sweeten the pot with the Romans was them saying, hey, you know what, we'll protect the Danube frontier, which was their territory. So like, that'd be like, right, like that'd be like me saying to you, like, like, hey, bro, you know what? Um, You can pay me and I will make sure that nobody comes on your lot when you're just renting like a little shack on my property, right? Like, I'm like, hey, bro, nobody's going to hurt you here, right? We're going to protect you, but you just need to pay me for your protection. But I'm also protecting my own property, right? So it's like, it's not it's not necessarily like the Romans were really getting much out of this. It was one of those, like, you'll see this a lot with the Huns and the Romans and their negotiations. They, they, they throw in a lot of, like, a lot of stuff that kind of makes you think, like, like, they really, <laughs> they really have these guys, like, collared. A hundred percent. The negotiations are, they, and they get bigger and bigger and bigger, as we'll see. It just gets more and more insane and more and more one-sided. You know, to add to what you just said, it's like you're having this negotiation with me just after you've broken both my knees and then telling me you're <laughs> going to protect me. It, it, that's how one-sided it is, right? So so it also stated that they would return any Hunnic refugees that, that had um, escaped to Rome and that were possible political enemies of of the huns or however they were refugees from the huns running away that the huns wanted back and then the lastly is the romans would pay eight solidi to the huns for every roman prisoner returned which is a ransom and detailed us how much like what a solidi is worth i'll get to the solidi but one thing i want to mention about the refugees that is important is in this deal they they wanted all the refugees that currently were in rome which, you know, as Riley alluded to, could have been political prisoners or noblemen who maybe opposed the ascension of uh, Attila and Blida. But they also wanted all of the refugees that would also, like, after the fact, go into Rome. And you could see again how this is like, like, they were cunning. Like, this is cunning. This is this is really smart of the Huns because what they're saying is you're going to give us back our people who disagree with you or, or who disagree with us or we're going to cause you trouble. Oh, also, anybody else that escapes us further, and that could have, it could have been Huns, it could have been other people that may have been under the Hunnic control. They're saying you're going to return them. So what does this do for the Romans? Well, now they don't have a force they can draw on, right? Like throughout history, how often have people utilized uh, the dispossessed uh, for war, right? Oh, you just got kicked out of your territory by by this mean, bad king. Well, you know what? We don't like him either. And if you fight for us, we'll, we'll give you that land back yourself, right? So they entice them and say, like they use them. Hey, you come and fight for us. We're going to give you what you're running from, right? Um, so now this was taken out of the equation and the Romans, they, they, they didn't have a secondary reserve to draw upon for military forces, and they were also forced to give back anybody that could uh, provide any political or mili- like political intrigue or information on the Huns. Uh, anyway, a Salidi was uh, roughly about four, uh, four and a half gram coin, and we're going to be bouncing back between uh, pounds and grams. Uh, so I'll, I'll try to, I'm going to stick to kilograms personally, so I'll try to make that seem a little bit as consistent as possible. But anyway, a Salidi was a roughly four and a half gram coin of nearly pure gold. So it was, it was a pretty important coin. Uh, so eight of these per prisoner, uh, doing a little math here, would equal about 36 grams of gold per person. So now imagine uh, through their campaigning, the Huns have captured 10,000 Roman prisoners or peoples. And they're basically saying, hey, guys, like, we don't want to feed these guys. You're taking them back. Like the, Rom- the Romans might not even want these dudes. Like they might just be like, like, I, like I, these guys were like on the, the frontier, the furthest edges of our kingdom. We have nothing to do with them. But the Huns are saying you're going to take them back. So now 36 grams of gold per person, when you multiply that by 10,000 people, that's 360 kilograms of extra gold on top of the 320 kilograms that was agreed upon yearly in the treaty, which is in kilograms, it's about 700 pounds. Um, yeah, and after after this was taken care of and after this was done, there was there was a momentary lull in the Roman Hun relations. Uh, Attila basically, you know, he's like, "Hey, we, we got the we got the Romans under heel. They're paying us. It's fine. Uh, let's let's go do something else." So he went and tried his luck against the uh, Sassanids in modern day Armenia to do what his predecessors on this step had not. Um, but we don't actually know. There's not a lot of historical record because they were nomads and they just cared about war, not about uh, you know they don't want to. <laughs> get away with your books bro i don't care right um so we don't actually know what happened but we do know that they went back to the hungarian plains but yeah like I, I when i think about it man like 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 they 
they really didn't have to do much. Like they go in, they sack a few towns and the, the Romans are kind of like, well, we can't really fight this, right? Like, so, and you'll see this over and over with the Huns is they give the Romans like the most inopportune deals that they possibly could. And it like, it's, there's so many different things going on at once that contribute to both the fall of Rome and the success of the Huns. It's, it's hard to believe. Like, like we, we give a ton of examples, but like, yeah, like imagine I go to Riley's house or, or like in, in, I don't know. I, I have like a bunch of cans and I'm like, hey, bro, you're taking these cans off my hands. He's like, I don't want these. Right. I'm like, and you're going to pay me for them. Right. Like I just throw my garbage at him and I'm like, now give me money. Right. It's kind of what the, the Huns are doing to the Romans. Yeah. And I think at this point, 700 pounds of gold isn't really that much to the Romans, especially seeing as we're talking about Constantinople. So we are talking about the Eastern Roman Empire, which is still really, really wealthy at the time. And I think that they were pretty comfortable with buying this breathing room. And they weren't, they hadn't really been crushed by the Huns yet. You know, the Huns had been invading and they had been sacking a couple cities here and there, but it wasn't really a crushing blow had been dealt to the Romans anywhere from the Huns. So I think they were pretty comfortable paying this money, buying themselves a bit of breathing room. They still had big, big gold reserves that they weren't having to dive into. And they were pretty successful at buying some breathing room from the Huns. You know, Ashton talked about the Huns going off and fighting the Sassanids. But another thing they did during this time, this sort of five-year area of relative peace, and this is going to become important, is they they go off and they act as mercenaries for a very important Roman named Aetius, who paid them to fend off a Burgundian invasion in France. I think this is also a cool reference point for just how massive the Hunnic Empire is at the time. They Their, their scope of operation is armenia to france that's like five thousand kilometers seeing as they can't go through turkey they have to go all the way around this is a massive empire that the huns have amassed at this point so yeah as riley was saying uh with etius and you know the the after after he paid the huns to go and deal with their burgundian king which was an incredible distance the the huns were successful in in dealing with it they killed him in 337 uh and this is actually, this is kind of a, um, this happened a lot more in classical warfare than we think, but it goes to show the brutality of the Hunnic Empire, or maybe not the brutality, but maybe the brutality of Attila. There was 20,000 civilians killed um, by the Huns in this invasion dealing with Gundahar. And, and bear in mind, like these people, these weren't people that the Huns directly had an issue with. This was, the the Burgundians were actually what were known as a uh, and this will become important later, uh, federati uh, for the Romans, which basically meant uh, allies, right? There was a federation. Um, we we settle you in our lands, we pay you some money, you come and fight for us, right? At this point, the Roman Empire, a lot of their militaristic power was actually, it was these these groups of Goths or Alans or, or you know, Vandals, or maybe not so much the Vandals, but people who basically were settled in the areas that the Romans allowed them to settle, who said, hey, we're not going to give you guys any trouble, but you're going to come and you're, you can be part of the empire, but you're going to fight for us. You're going to do what we ask you to, and you're going to do what we ask you not to. Well, the Burgundians actually, um, they were raiding north of Rome. This is such a weird thing. So they were federati, they were allies of Rome, but then they were raiding Roman territory. And then Aetius basically said, hey guys, that's enough of that. And then he's like, oh, I'm sorry, I won't do it again. But then, you know, Aetius had enough. He paid them Huns, they go and kill them, right? But again, this weren't, this wasn't the bone for the Huns to pick, but they still ended up massacring 20,000 civilians. So it's, they don't really care. Like you, you got to realize like when they go into a place and they're killing and arrows are slinging they're at, at a point, it's like, they're just like, let, let the, let the shafts fall where they may. Right. If you have an arrow in your back and you were just some simple farmer, well, that, that's your unlucky day. Right now. Y- y- well, it's, it's also important to note that this massacre of the Burgundians it's a really important addition to the lore of the Huns being this super ruthless force because they really did just go in and massacre 20,000 people. And I think that it shows that the Huns, they're perfectly okay with mass murder. They're okay with this. This doesn't bother them at all. And I think it, it sort of comes down to what we were talking about earlier about how the Huns, they operate on a different on a different level. As, as I said in the intro of Attila, it said that once he subjugated people, that he was quite fair with them and quite good to them, actually. But when he sees you as an enemy, whether it's an enemy of Rome and you're paying him to, to fight for you, he he has no remorse. And he's he's a warrior, man. I, I think it's we, we can't 
discount just how ruthless Attila was willing to be to save his his face because I I personally believe that he's dr- dramatized in Roman history as how this evil boogeyman he was but at some points he really isn't dramatic like he's it's not dramatic it's quite accurate and I think that the slaughter of the Burgundians is an example of this so that that's just an important note I wanted to make mentioning slaughter how often do you like how often do you think about this when when we're reading about history like this because like i i know for myself whether i'm listening to a a different history podcast about you know the greeks and the romans and the persians or i'm I'm watching a video or i'm reading a book and like what we see is numbers right we see figures and numbers and dates and places and people and it doesn't really register with us that that was that was the world as we see it today as well, right? Like it, not not the world as we see it, but that was existence, right? That was reality. And that twenty thousand people, like you look at the number compared to some slaughters, like oh twenty thousand, that's not a lot. Like bro, like twenty thousands, like 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 I like guess that's, that's like neighborhoods of people. Like imagine imagine those bodies piled up in a field, the blood, the gore, the like all of the the awful things that are part and parcel of ancient warfare, and like they're just, they're a different breed, right? People of this time were a different breed because I, I personally, I don't know what I would do if I had to encounter that. Imagine you're, imagine you were, a, you were traveling to and from a city and you come across this battlefield or this town where the slaughter ensued and you just, the smell of burning flesh and there's just the smell of decay and death. And like, we don't actually think about that when we think of history, but I think it's important too, because that's one of the teaching elements of history is that that's the, those are the things that can happen when things go wrong or when you're on the losing end, right? Like, it's not just a number. Those were 20,000 human lives, right? A uh, bit of a side note, but uh, yeah, I, I want to know your opinion on that, Riley. You know, every time I dive into human history, I think that a lot of people have a utopian view of humanity. And I think that the more we read about human history, I think that the more we have to accept that stories of slaughter, stories of genocide, stories of horrific warfare, that is human history. Human history isn't pretty. It's horrific. The Rwandan genocide was like 50 50 years ago, not even. 900,000 people slaughtered with machetes over 100 days. That's like, in in the scope of history, that's like yesterday. This stuff is still happening. It's happening today as we speak. And the putting blinders on and pretending that that's not human nature almost like i think that's a stretch to say that's human nature but to say that it's very capable that all of us as humans can do these genocidal acts is something that we just have to accept right i don't want to sell people these these fake wolf tickets of hey everything's going to be great and we're all happy go lucky people that's not the reality of the situation and i think that attila is a great embodiment of someone who he just was doing what he was born and bred to do. This stuff is natural for him. Do you think that he went home and cried about the slaughter of the Burgundians? No. No. He just kept operating the way he did. This was this was a Tuesday for the Huns, and it was it was what Attila had been grown up in was seeing these massacres. It was probably a victory for him, you know? And we would look at this retroactively and be like, oh my god, this is so horrible. But then realistically, it's like the slaughter of the Burgundians, compare that to the Holomador or the Holocaust, compare that to these, these things that happened so, so much more recently, we really haven't learned anything as people. And I think that it's important to not discount Attila as an other, discount him as, oh yeah, but he was just Attila the Hun. No, there's been a thousand Attila the Huns over the course of history. And that this, this is a good example of human Nature. potential. Yeah. Yeah, and, and and like like you reminded me of something while you were talking there and I think this is something that a lot of people don't often think about and you know the platform may not be that big but I want to take this moment to share it. Uh and it, that's perspective, right? Cuz like Riley was saying like you think you wouldn't have been like that, right? Like if you all the people who say like like bro if I was back then I would have killed Attila with a knife. I w- I wouldn't have been a hun. I wouldn't have killed innocents or like the people who say if I was in Nazi Germany I would have fought the Nazis. It's like I'm sorry but if you were a citizen of Germany and during Nazi Germany there is a and you weren't Jewish there is a very good likelihood that you were a Nazi and you were in the Wehrmacht or you were fighting for Hitler not because you were a bad person but because that's what you were that was the time you were born into, right? Like it's not 
it's very easy to like you like like Riley said put on those blinders and and look at history through a modern perspective but that is just plain wrong and, and you can't do that if you ever want to actually learn anything from history because then you're judging 2000 years ago by the standards of today and that just never works but anyway um yeah so we've just sort of finished the slaughter of the burgundians and attila he sort of retreats back to his home which was in the hungarian plains and he hangs out there for there's sort of a lull in in history as to what he's doing at this time it could have been that he was at the sassanids at yeah this time i'm we not actually know. positive where it could have been that those invasions could have been simultaneous remember the huns are, are large groups of different people you know it's hard to even pinpoint if attila was at the slaughter of the burgundians it's possible that he wasn't even there um but yeah, just worthy. Just just before Riley continues, just just for like the understanding's sake, three thirty five Treaty of Margus, and then between three thirty five and four forty one, Attila was paid by uh, Flavius Aetius, the uh, general of the Western Roman Empire, to go and take out the Burgundian king. And at somewhere in this time frame, he had also went on a campaign against the Sassanids in Armenia. We don't know if, like Riley said, they were concurrent or one was before the other. But all we know is that it happened. And then in 441, he found himself back uh, in the home base, the Great Hungarian Plains. Exactly. So while he's in the Hungarian Plains, this is around four, you know, we're, we're, we're around 441. The Eastern Roman Empire has actually taken a massive contingent of their soldiers and sent them to North Africa to fight the Vandals, who we touched on briefly in the last episode. Now, something that's important to note here is historians have retroactively split the Roman Empire into West and East. They actually didn't do this themselves. They had two separate governing forces, and they had um, definitely different governments operating. But according to Romans, they would have considered themselves all Romans. So it's actually retroactive that we have East and West Rome. Now, the Eastern Romans didn't need to do this. In fact, it was pretty clearly a Western Roman issue because North Africa was one of the major supply routes for food and resources to Western Rome. But it's also not that surprising that Eastern Rome would want to help out the Western Romans because they still viewed themselves as Romans. And they clearly have, over this past five years, developed some sort of confidence in the Hunnic alliance and i say that with quotations because it's it's very much so not an alliance but it's the friend the enemy of my enemy right and they're they're probably getting comfortable using the huns as mercenaries they're getting comfortable with these 700 pounds a year of gold they're sending so they're they're almost okay with moving the hun moving their defensive forces away from the huns and this turns out to be a major mistake and this is also the place that the huns uh said they'd protect right so Attila, being the conqueror he was, noticed the massive reallocation of forces by the Romans out of the Danube frontier. And what are you going to do in that instance? You're going to think, damn, I can get another payday, right? So what did they do? They began pillaging and raiding the countryside uh, that was now undefended. This, When you look back at it, it's very hard to like... Five years is a long time, so it's easy to understand in a way how they could get comfortable, right, from 335 to 441, thinking, oh, hey, look, we haven't been attacked by the Huns, and in fact, they actually just help us take out an enemy of Rome. It, maybe things are, you know, they're, they're looking up, right? But then Attila reminds them who he is, right? And it was at this point that, you know, like I said, they began pillaging, raiding, attacking, sacking towns, cities. And you might be saying, well, what about what about the Treaty of Margus, right? They they, they agreed upon something, you know, but that, that didn't mean anything to Attila. He accused the Romans of first violating that treaty uh, and how he did this. But he claimed that the Romans uh, had a bishop that desecrated Hunnic graves. And he also claimed that the Romans never actually returned those political prisoners and further prisoners that or, or refugees that fled into Rome. So at, at this point, you know, Attila is basically saying, like, listen, you guys... I'm doing I'm justified here, right? I'm okay with doing what I'm doing because you guys you guys screwed me over. So the Eastern Roman Empire uh, emperor sent uh, Flavius Aspar, who is a general, to deal with Attila and not deal with him, but to have negotiations with him. But it is alleged that Aspar did not actually know about these uh, refugees and that he did not actually know about the bishop who supposedly desecrated Hunnic graves. So it came to a standstill and there was no um there was no agreement made, uh, but for some reason they had assumed that there was going to be a ceasefire or, a, or, a, or you know, that there was not a ceasefire, they didn't have weapons, um, but a, an armistice, right, that there was no more fighting, right? 
and again, this was an assumption. There was, as far as we were aware, there's no indication from Attila that told Aspar said, "Hey, you know what? You, we, you're good. We're not gonna. We're not gonna. You guys are good. Go home." Right. So he was on his way back to Constantinople, and he reached there in the summer of 441 with no belief of an impending Hunnic invasion, which is just bonkers. <laughs> like, these guys just ravaged your town, broke the treaty, and said you did it, and you're going home after talking. I'm like, yeah, no, everything's all good. Yeah, we're, we're bros. <laughs> I talked it out, man. We're good. <laughs> yeah, we, 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 chest, out. we chest bumped, and, and we're on our way. <laughs> it's funny. Yeah. Attila does this, where he sort of makes up reasons to invade, and it's kind of weird to me. It doesn't really make sense. I think that he's doing it as a negotiation tactic, maybe, because... And I think that this proves that Attila always had the intentions of eventually renegotiating because he never just breaks his treaty as a warmonger. He always breaks his treaty according to some weird, far out there reason that never really stands up to any scrutiny. So I think that that's a proof, actually, that Attila knew that he wasn't really going to destroy the Romans, that he was more likely going to just kick their ass really badly. And then, yeah, exactly. Squeeze more gold out of them. But it's difficult to say because when I'm reading this history, the excuses he comes up with, they never make any sense. So it's definitely a bit of a stretch to suggest that the Romans had violated the treaty first, especially since they just moved their their forces away from the Danube. Because imagine you move your forces away and then break this treaty that's protecting you. It doesn't make any sense. It doesn't add up. The most likely assumption that happened was Attila, being a trained tactician, sees all these soldiers leave. And now he has the opportunity to double or triple the amount of money he's making from the Romans, and he's really not going to lose any soldiers in the process. As we talked about in the last episode, raiding is an essential key to the Hunnic economy. So when they see an opportunity to double or triple their money, and it's not going to cost them lives and cost them soldiers, well, they're going to take it. And yeah, Attila, being a Hun, takes it. And, and that's that's what he does here. And he, he proceeds to attack and he raises a lot of these Eastern Roman cities and he gets within 20 miles of Constantinople. Worthy, worthy of note is after these con- these conversations, like it begun with raiding and then Aspar went out to try to say, hey, stop the raiding, we're all good. And then as he was leaving, Attila basically mobilized for a full on invasion, right? And there's a big difference between an invasion of Rome and raiding Rome. And that's why he got so close to Constantinople, right? Yeah, I mean, we're talking about border skirmishes versus a full-on Hunnic invasion. And he gets really close, right? And he just sort of rampages the countryside for like two years. Sorry, actually, you had a cool story about how the bishop like had desecrated Hunnic graves and that Attila actually had a bit of legitimacy to what he was saying. Yeah, so and this is this is where it gets a little bit tricky, right? Because Aspar says, well, we don't know anything about this, right? And with the Romans moving their forces away, as you said, like, well, as as an alibi for their, their honesty, it's equally as likely that, you know, in the typical Roman arrogance that we see throughout history, like that, that they think that they can just pay people off and that they're fine and they're, they're, you know, like they think they're always going to win because they've won so much. It's possible that they, they did that full well knowing that... Um, they were in the wrong, but we don't know for sure. But it turns out that uh, during this invasion of the Eastern Roman Empire, there was actually a bishop who desecrated Hunnic graves. And not only did he desecrate the Hunnic graves, when the Romans had found out and they were discussing handing him over to the Huns, he betrayed a city, the city of Margus, to the Huns and just opened the gates for them. So like, what a slimy individual, right? Like he goes over there, basically i guess you could you could call it a it's it's breaking the treaty right i don't know if it's a war crime but you break the treaty and then you come back home base and you're like well i didn't do anything right and then the romans find out and they're like hey we're gonna get rid of you and he was like okay well then i'm just gonna give this city to the huns right so like that's that's pretty goddamn slimy if you think about it you try to play both sides exactly right I, i'm actually not sure what his fate is though i can assume that attila didn't take too like uh, too kindly to him desecrating graves when they found him so uh I, i'm assuming that they um they took care of him but uh yeah i think it's something i find kind of uh kind of interesting is throughout this invasion of the eastern roman empire they they were attacking cities right and these were these were nomads so you might ask well how can nomads know siege craft well as we mentioned earlier, the Romans had been utilizing them for close to 100 years at this point as mercenaries. So when you're fighting beside the Romans, watching the Romans take down cities and looking at these siege tools, it's not like the Huns are just sitting there like petting their horses, like, who's a good boy, right? No, <laughs> they're learning, they're watching, and they 
they yeah they basically adopt those those methods it said that they had uh, both battering rams and siege towers i think that's a really good point because it's funny a lot of the other gothic people had trouble sort of sacking and and getting past roman walls but the huns never really did it's sort of when we talk about especially later the huns were sacking dozens of cities so they were getting past many different cities bat- uh, batteries and and defenses so it, it's definitely an important note to to say that using the huns as mercenaries could have blown up in their face pretty pretty exponentially seeing as the huns the huns developed really advanced military tactics and they were able to defeat the romans at their own game not that not that they didn't have enough guys to do it themselves just by overwhelming force but now they're doing it through decisive military victories as well and who's teaching him these tactics right when he was a kid and he's learning these tactics his parents are teaching them his, his uncles are teaching them these tactics from years and years and years of experience and a lot of that experience would have come directly from the romans but after about two years of rampaging through the Eastern Roman Empire, Theodosius II, he, he realizes, okay, I can't beat these guys. And he enters into another treaty. And, and this treaty, it more than triples the amount of gold that the Romans have to pay to Bleda and Attila. And I think the, the sum was something like 6,000 pounds of gold or 2,720 kilograms a year. That's an absurd amount of money even for the romans at this time and we have to remember the romans are not the same empire they once were something i was thinking about while i was studying this actually was in my opinion and i don't know what your opinion is but my opinion augustus caesar is the pinnacle of rome roman history right that was 400 years before the hunnic invasion more than four it was like 450 years before the hunnic invasion now to give a reference, when, when I think about antiquity, I sometimes get lost in the scope of how long it is. Imagine what was going on in 1550. The country we live in, Canada, it didn't even exist. So the Rome of this period, the Rome dealing with the Huns is so different. They're hundreds of years separated from the Rome that was this military might, ever expanding, trained, motivated soldiers good leadership this is gone this is almost a completely different group of people running the country it's been 400 years just think about how different france was 400 years ago to france today it's important to note because this isn't the same rome this is a very different rome it's not static right like it definitely grew and developed and i have a book on the legions of rome and uh for this episode actually for last episode i had done a bit of a brief reading about this period in the Roman Empire and I had mentioned this in the last episode and I'm going to mention it again because it goes to show the difference in discipline between both forces like the Roman military like the, the legit like the, the legions at this point they were complaining to their chain of command that their gear their kit was too heavy right so they're like well I don't want to wear this helmet I don't want to wear these this breastplate it's too heavy it's too hot out right <laughs> it's like like these <laughs> these these are the guys you have defending you against these these ruthless like horsemen that will cut you down and not have a second thought about it right it's it's pretty it's pretty incredible um Talking about how much the Romans had to pay, though, I want to riff on this a little bit because there's a little bit of math involved. Not nothing crazy, but it's it's fun for me. So this this new treaty signed in 443, uh, the Romans had to pay this, like Riley said, this flat fee of 2,720 kilograms of, of gold. That's 2,720 2, kilograms. That is immense. Um and what was their justification for saying, hey, you got to pay us this incredible amount of money? Oh, well, because remember when we broke the treaty by raiding your territory? Yeah, when we broke the treaty, you guys actually stopped paying us. And we want you to pay us that money that we were owed in that time that we were taking more money from your your towns. Right? Um, but anyway, uh, that alone, 2,720 kilograms is equal to about three tons or, you know, for comparison, two, this is about the size of two modern day cars worth of gold. So my, my Volkswagen Jetta is sitting out in my parking lot. Uh, two of those, that amount of gold. Imagine having to be the guy transporting that, right? Uh, on top of this, they also increased the, the ransom that we mentioned earlier of a Solidi, eight Solidi to 12. Now this is where the, the math actually starts. Um, so now imagine again, there was another 10,000 Roman prisoners. And it's very likely that there was far less because there'd only be, you know, like you're only willing to pay for certain people. And I'm sure the Romans would have 
would have fought for that. Like, hey, we don't want this scrub who's like 80 years old. Like, what's he going to do for us? I don't want to pay for him, right? Um, but anyway, for an arbitrary number, let's say there was another 10,000 prisoners that the Romans were taking back. So you're paying the 2,720 kilograms uh, in the one-time fee. And now, assuming Attila wants his yearly payment of 950 kilograms up front, that's 3,670 kilograms. Now you add on the value from the ransom of the 10,000 prisoners, which alone, by the way, with the increased price um, of the ransom would be 540 kilograms, which is greater than and you know almost double than what they were paying previously just year by year. You're now paying Attila 4,210 kilograms of gold, and that's equal to about 4.7 U.S. tons or about 3.2 modern cars weighed in gold. So imagine having to pay this to him as well right after he just ravaged and burned down your countryside. So now you have these towns that need repairing. You have displaced people that need food. You have you have your military is now decimated because you've been losing against him and you realize that you need to pay him. And on top of all of those other problems, there's also a plague ravaging the world at this point. Imagine after on top of all these problems, you got to pay this incredible amount, 4.7 tons. Think of what you think of when you think of a ton. You think of a whole heavy ass thing, right? 4.7 tons worth of gold out of the pockets of the, the Roman Empire to this guy who just just keeps on squeezing them like it like. Yeah, at this point, like the Romans, you know, and they're, they're again, the Roman arrogance, they tried to disguise it as, well, he's a client king of Rome. He were simply paying him to do our bidding and be a mercenary for us. In reality, the Romans were Attila's ATM. They were the, they were ready tellers and uh, they were they were pretty goddamn subdued. Absolutely. You know, but it succeeds, right? They successfully pay Attila to go away and he goes back to the Hungarian plains and it's quite crazy, the time frame, because he comes back in two years. So he's definitely a motivated man, but we don't really know what happens over these two years that he's gone for. All we know is that Attila comes back alone. So we know that as he's gone over these last ne next two years, Belita ends up dead. Now, Priscus, who is a really important historian about the times of Attila, he writes that Attila killed his brother. Now, it's easily argued that uh, Belita could have died of anything. He could have died of any of the million things that killed people back in these times and that Priscus was just writing about just making the story a bit better. It, Priscus's writings, they never survived in their entirety. So we're taking a translation of a translation of a story that could have been dramatized pretty dramatically. When in reality, there's no real way that Priscus could have known what happened between Belita and Attila. He would have been getting this information from rumors or who knows how he got it. Personally, I have no idea. I think it's totally plausible that Attila killed his brother, but I think it's also just as plausible that his brother died of anything. I mean, you could fall off a horse, break your neck and be dead. Like, who knows? Anything could have happened. Life was tough at this time. And Attila and his brother, they reigned pretty amicably for like 11 years, so... It's hard to say. I mean, imagine, like, I was actually going to mention this earlier in the podcast, but like we said about Ruga and Oktar, how they were the leaders of the Hunnic Empire, and then all of a sudden it became Attila and Blida. Well, some historians like to speculate, um, and the point of why I'm bringing this up, some historians like to speculate that there was actually, uh, there were sons of Ruga and Oktar that somehow, and I'm doing air quotes right now, somehow, meaning Attila and Blita dispatched them uh, or disposed of them on campaign, somehow died, which then left Attila and Blita to be the sole heir. And then you see the same recurring theme here when Blita dies. Like, man, you see this back and like, even like going back is like the Persian Empire, right? Like when, like when some of the kings died, they, there's always these elaborate stories that people make up, right? Like they want to tell a story. They want to, they want to make it a, into a, a book or like a, like a play, right? Like that a lot of history is told by these people in the sense where they want it to be captivating. And so you lose a lot of the factual basis of it. And you see that here with Attila and Blida. Like it's whenever you see, and he was assassinated so he could take soul power. I, I would urge you to be suspicious because of how often that motif comes up. I was going to ask you, Riley, because I know you looked into more of Priscus than I, I did. Who, who, what, well, who was he? Was he like, was he a diplomat? Was he just a historian? I'm not sure. I actually didn't. I didn't check too much as to what his major role in Rome was, but his writing is definitely dramatic. It's definitely written to be read. 
historians, especially during this time, they didn't do as much of the university level, this is what happened, researching and then just sort of placing the words on a page. They always wrote very... They wrote Observationally. for a reader. Yeah, and they also wrote for a reader. And they also, they were pretty comfortable with taking information from people that were not definite sources, yeah, right? Cra- so Priscus could have... Priscus could have been getting information from some random guy that came down from the Hunnic people and was like, hey, man, yeah, I was just hanging out with Attila and I saw him kill his brother. And Priscus was like, that's a cool story because we haven't seen his brother since. And then just writes it down. There's no real way to say, oh, yeah, no. And historians like to, even today, when they read something that's cool, they like to pass that information on. It's what we're doing right now. Realistically, if this podcast was a was just like a, hey, this is what happened with... I wouldn't be saying that Attila killed his brother because I don't have that information. But it's a cool story, and and it's also... It could potentially be true. So I want to give our listeners as much information as we possibly can. But if I was writing an essay, all I would say is, we don't know what happened. Attila comes back alone. But it's important that he comes back. And I think that... I know, And I know with Priscus, I don't know what he was doing at this time when Bleda died. I do know that he was a... Uh, he was a, a diplomat, or he was part of the uh, emissary or embassy or whatever word you want to use to Attila. But this was in 449, right? So this is four years after the fact. So unless like Attila like looked him in the eyes when it's like I killed him, like <laughs> we don't really know, right? Um, yeah. yeah, we don't even know because a lot of Priscus's work didn't even survive. So like it, it's hard to say. But another important point is during this time that Attila is gone, we have to remember that the Romans had signed a treaty that was unbelievably expensive even to them at this time especially seeing as they just had a bunch of their area sacked by the huns so a bunch of their money making capabilities limited and it's assumed and i believe this that the romans never actually paid the huns that they just sort of signed this treaty to get themselves some breathing room and i think it's also i I don't even know if that's arrogance man because you have to then at, at that point you have to decide okay am i gonna pay the huns for security that's not confirmed at all or am i going to take that money and instead raise a military build defenses and then and then try to fight them on the field and that's probably what they did they chose a gambit you know to take a take a line from one of their predecessors that was one of the greatest men of all of roman history and julius caesar you know the die is cast right they made it i mean i would have done the same thing if i was Pro- if i probably, was yeah. the emperor i would have been like okay i can't trust these hun guys i'm not going to pay them this absorbent amount of money i'm instead going to raise a military and attila uses this as his now he's got another reason to come back is hey you guys haven't been paying me last time i was almost completely unopposed this is an easy cash grab and he comes back after not even four years away he comes back to the balkans and he just this time it's a whole different scale of destruction he ravages a recording of up to 70 cities and towns just destroys them and the romans probably let him do this they probably concede these towns because they have to take this military and this army that they've raised and centralize it so that they can actually fight him because if you have 10 small armies and you're dealing with one large army all your 10 small armies are going to lose instead of two instead of having one big army fight one big army and that's what they do and they get they get this they get a military together and they they meet the huns on the battlefield in the battle of utus in dacia or Utus. Yeah, so the Romans were, uh, they were defeated, but uh, for the Huns, it was a bit of a Pyrrhic victory. So they could say they won the day, but what they lost was immense. Uh, There was a large amount of casualties for the Huns. And, you know, like I said, the Romans had worse luck than the Huns. And so now all of those towns that were left undefended, um, all the ones that weren't burnt to the ground already, mind you, until it was like, all right, well, we just kind of, yeah, we we lost 30,000 dudes. You guys lost 40. You don't have an army. I have 100,000 dudes on horses ready to go. Let's get some, right? So he, uh, he he went to start pillaging. He went back to what he was doing. And eventually this pillaging in these provinces led to Constantinople once again. He had his eyes on the great city. Um, but it was the capital of the Eastern Empire, and it was strongly defended by the Theodosian Walls. And if you don't know what the Theodosian Walls are, um, I'll explain. So imagine imagine here's the city, right? The city's in the center, and now there's one wall that is, say, it, they're, they're pretty substantial heights. There's one wall now that is 18 meters high, 
right? And in between that wall, there's a 10 meter long no man's land to the next wall. And then that wall is say 12 meters high. And then there's another 10, 10, um, 10 meter long no man's land. And then the last wall, the most outer wall is six meters high. So you have to look at it from the Hunnic perspective. They breach that first wall. Well, now they, there's 10 meters of just death and destruction that the Romans can rain down on them as they make it to the next wall. They make it past that wall. Well, now there's an 18 meter wall they need to get up and another 10 yards of destruction. And this, these walls actually, they were completed in 413 AD. So this was about 34, 34, 35 years before Attila was knocking down their, knocking on their door. So it's, it's likely that uh, had the Huns you know, congregated and went on this campaign and Attila was existent 100 years previous, it's likely that Constantinople wouldn't have lasted until 1453 AD like it did when the Ottomans had to build a giant cannon to blast a hole through the walls. But anyway, uh, another little interesting... Well, just to touch really quickly, you said 10 meters. It's probably a bit more than 10 meters. 10 meters is pretty small. But that is, as far as defenses go, that's crazy. To have a triple wall defense and... To with varying how, varying heights yeah and to consider how difficult it would be just to get over one set of walls you can't bring the siege equipment over the wall with you so to to defeat constantinople would have been a massive undertaking right and until has just lost a big chunk of his army and he's been raiding now for already a couple years he's just been ravaging these cities and he's got a lot of loot with him right yeah Another uh, another brief stroke of luck regarding Constantinople that, uh, you know, the Romans, they, whatever god, it was actually the Christian god at this time that they should have been praying to and thanking. In January of 447, so the year this was occurring, there was actually an earthquake that damaged parts of the Theodosian walls. And if it wasn't for the Praetorian prefect, Constantius, of uh, the Eastern Roman Empire at this point, and a Praetorian prefect is essentially, there was four of them in the Roman Empire. So there was the emperor of the east, emperor of the west, and then in those two halves of the empire, which, like Riley said earlier, was retroactively imposed. They didn't view it that way. There was four pieces of the pie that were then cut up where there was Praetorian prefects. And they acted as kind of prime ministers or presidents of a however many states were in their sphere of influence. Anyway, he, Constantius, utilized uh, a mass mobilization of manpower to repair these walls within two months, um, within two months. And at this time, Constantinople was being ravaged by the plague. So their walls were broken and they were being ravaged by a plague, but yet somehow, and this is incredible, he still managed to get this up and running. And one of the ways he actually did it, and this is like this is kind of like a, you know, like a, an early version of allowing it to the private sector and not the public sector. He utilized the uh, the circus factions of the Hippodrome of Constantinople. So what does that mean? He basically said, hey, you carnies, you guys are good at setting things up and tearing it down for your shows. Come help me rebuild these walls. And they managed to secure their fortifications within two months, which is massive. Because had that not happened, it's unlikely Attila would have turned his attention southwards, um, which, you know which gave the Romans some breathing room. And, you know, Riley will get into what he did when he went south because I've been talking about walls for 10 minutes, so I need a drink of water. (laughs) Well, I actually did have a quick point on taking Constantinople. And I think that this goes back into an analyzation of Attila's movements and also how the Huns operated at this time. I've read some historians say that there's, it's inexplicable why he didn't go after Constantinople, that it doesn't really make sense why he didn't, you know, rally his forces and that he he had such a focus on Constantinople. In my opinion, I think Attila probably felt pretty accomplished as defeating the Romans at this time. I think that after this massive rampage of destruction and defeating Romans time and time again, I don't think that taking Constantinople to him would have been some great victory because we have to remember that the Huns are doing this not strictly for egotistical gain, and they're not trying to expand their empire. They very rarely go into an area, destroy everything, and then stay and plant their roots there. They're not like a lot of other cultures. They're not like the Romans, like that. They like to go in, destroy, take money, and then leave, and they don't want to cut off the... They're using Constantinople as a bank. So destroying it for temporary money is probably going to be less beneficial for Attila in the long run. Realistically, he's right outside the walls. He's got a massive army. He's defeated the Romans every time he's come into contact with them. His ego's set. 
So he does, he does instead of go to Constantinople, which would have been incredibly costly for him as far as losing soldiers would have been. It would have been probably not worth it in the long run. And his ego's, his ego's set. So instead he goes south to Greece and just starts ravaging Macedonia and, and northern Greece. And he, he sort of keeps ravaging down there until he gets to Thermopylae, right? Yeah, and he stopped at Thermopylae, and at that point, uh, a yet another treaty is signed. Hey, shocker. Um, but this treaty, uh, the Romans would pay the aforementioned yearly sums. It's suspected that the sum increased, so the yearly sum at this time was 950 kilograms per year. The solidity was at 12 per year. Um, we can either assume that it stayed the same or it increased. There's no real figure to go off of uh, because, believe it or not, we are reaching the twilight of Attila. Um his loss at uh, Utis and Dacia, and then his turning away from Constantinople. At this point, it was, it, it was it, not to say it wasn't in. It wasn't obvious at the time that there was a downfall occurring for him, but it looked like this. Like that was one of his first, like you could say, close to losses, right, against the Romans. But anyway, he uh, he would like that the treaty stated that the Romans would pay the yearly sum or the yearly sum uh, the same solidi and also they would pay the 6000 pounds or 2720 kilograms uh, lump sum that they never paid when they you know they rolled the dice and said okay well, we'll just fight you right and then they lost um on top of this treaty as well uh remember how we mentioned the danube frontier and how that area was firmly in hunnic control well, Roman, the Romans did have settlements south of that frontier, and part of the treaty was uh, that the Romans needed to vacate all of the areas 100 miles south of the Danube frontier, which would have been about five days travel. So the Huns basically said, hey, this is a no man's land. This is our territory. In a way, they kind of, it was like a soft annexation because they said like, they didn't say this is now our territory, but simply said, you're not putting anybody in this territory. So we can move through freely through your territory, but you can't inhabit this territory. Right. Um, and again, after these victories, Attila and his forces, they returned to, uh, I'm just going to refer to it as the home base, which was the Hungarian plains. So if you hear me say home base again, just know it's Hungarian plains. Yeah, it's it's cool to note, too, you know, and realistically, the Huns, even though the Battle of Uchis was, they lost a lot of people, they didn't lose and they kept invading. There's only so much gold and riches you can carry around. So these invasions, they have a time limit. They have an expiration date where Attila's going to have to go back. He's going to have to let his, his men rest and recover, get fat. He's going to have to store these riches somewhere. He's going to have to use them to increase his economic stature. He's going to want to go party, have a good time. So there's a lot of reasons outside of, oh, this became dangerous for him to stop his invasions. And also, like Ashton was saying, there is a plague going on. And it's cool. If you look at a lot of a lot of history, and if you look at militaries that moved around, they lost massive numbers of people to disease. So, I mean, going back and resetting in the Hungarian plains, which is a place where he's completely safe, no one's going to come and mess with the Huns. <laughs> um, this, is, this is perfectly good for him. And, and I think that he was pretty confident in his defeat of eastern rome like i said there's a lot of historians that they paint the picture that it doesn't make sense why attila left and never came back and never finished defeating constantinople in my opinion he did defeat constantinople do you know what i mean like sure he didn't take the city but he was completely undefeated by eastern rome in my opinion he, he's he's very confident that he's completed enough in the region I mean, considering the fact that nobody took the city until the Ottomans uh, a thousand years later, like, yeah, he, he pretty much did all that he could do, right? Like, he had, exactly. it to the, he had it to the point where the Romans were stuck inside the city and that if they came out, like, they were on his playground, right? Constantinople, um, in my opinion, might they, that might as well have been in a completely impenetrable city at the yeah. time. But yeah. the technology that people had at the time, it was pretty much impossible for anyone to take Constantinople. Unless you had like 500,000 people and 1,000 trebuchets, right? Like you would have and to... And were willing to lose three quarters of them. Exactly. You would have to pepper that place. Uh, a fun note about uh, Attila that um, this actually, I believe, came from Priscus uh, when he was the, an envoy to uh, Attila. He actually went to, um, it was, I think it was pronounced Wallachia, which was like the, the home base uh, in the area in the Hungarian plains. Um, of Attila it is said that he threw a great banquet for the Roman envoys so he's like oh hey what's up guys like I love Romans <laughs> he threw a banquet for them and it said that at this banquet and this is a bit telling of his character 
he, everybody else had silver and gold cups and goblets, and many of the nobles had gold and jewelry adorning their horses, but Attila was simple. It is said that he wore simple dress, simple clothing. His horse was unadorned. Uh, he ate off of a, he ate a, like a, basically like a stick of mutton off of a wooden plate and drank out of a wooden cup. So very ascetic, very stoic. He wasn't, which is, is bizarre. Like, it makes you wonder if the conquering was for his people or if it was for himself and the image when it seems like his image he portrayed was as somebody who just needed the fundamentals, right? But it's, you know, it's pretty remarkable when you're probably one of the wealthiest people in the world at this time. And as Riley was saying, just this just popped into my mind about uh, the Huns on the Hungarian plain and why nobody would go and attack them there. Um, a little fun fact about history this type of people, nomadic horse tribes, have been causing problems for great empires for, like, let's look at it like this. So th at this point in history, this was about 1,500 years ago before us, and at this point in history, 450, 1,500 years before that, the Scythians and even possibly the Xiongnu, as we mentioned in the last episode, were causing problems for the Babylonians, for basically Mesopotamia, for the Babylonians, the Assyrians, for the, uh, the Persians when they came to. So, like, these guys were tough to deal with, and, like... What are you going to do? That's why the Great Wall but, exists exactly. in China. And, and, like, and like, what are you going to do, right? Because like you, you go and you try to attack the Huns. Like If you actually try to launch, launch an offensive, it's like, bro, they live on a plane. They can just run away from you. Like they don't, <laughs> they don't have forts and cities and towns and garrisons that you can capture and raise. Like, yeah, maybe they can. Like the, literally the one thing that they could do is maybe find burial sites to goad you into a battle, right? But outside of that, like... There's they, they, like, if they don't want to fight you, this is what makes them so frustrating, right? Because if they don't want to fight you, they don't have to fight you. But if they want to take what you have, you have to fight them, right? So it's, they're, they're an incredibly versatile group of people that were just so incredibly effective. Yeah. And as you know, as you mentioned, they're even finding a burial site. The Huns kept their burial sites secret for their chieftains. So it's like, even for them, it's even an, an extra layer of security it was it was almost impossible to take the huns on in their home home land um although there is actually a point where that might have happened but that's later in the story and we'll get to that in a second but at this point so you said that etius is he's gone and he's hanging out with attila right uh no he that was in i think 433 there was like this is this is more roman history than it is uh, uh hunnic history but there was a, a civil war essentially brewing in um the western roman empire the the king uh valentian the third he was a child um his mother uh, gala placidia she kind of pulled the strings and gala placidia was allied with bonifacius a guy who was a governor of uh, north africa and etius was clever and cunning and he was trying to play them against each other to basically have sole control of the western empire because the, the most powerful general uh when there was a boy emperor was essentially the emperor um so in 433 uh he was exiled to the huns so he knew attila personally like they had they had you know they'd hung out before but all, not only that but etius actually um he as a as a young man in about 408 um bc which or ad sorry was he went and was a hostage of the Huns, um, and the hostage is a political hostage, not as like actually taken hostage. Uh, so he learned their ways. He knew their language. He knew their he knew their tactics. He knew their strategy. He knew them as a people, which you know it contributes to the idea of how Etius was actually effective. He he wasn't a great general in the sense that he was noble and honorable, but he was a good tactician and great at warfare. Um, so he he definitely had he had ties to the Huns. He knew the yeah, Huns. And and he'd used them to defeat the Burgundians, right? Yeah, yeah. So he so, he, he knew what they were capable of, right? But yeah, and he becomes an important character because Attila, now that he's he's headed back to the Hungarian plains, he's sort of defeated the Eastern Roman Empire. Now he sets his eyes on the Western Roman Empire, and his official declaration is that he he intends to to conquer the Visigoth Kingdom, which is ruled by King Theodoric. And it, it's likely that he was spurred on by the gifts provided by, how do you pronounce that? Geseric? I, it's, it's many different. There's, there's ge, some say Genseric, some say Geseric, some say like, yeah, I don't know. Geseric, Geseric is what I say. But. but he's king of the Vandals in North Africa. And it's assumed that Geseric feared Theodoric and viewed him as a rival. So he's using Attila as his own sort of political pawn to attack Theodoric. But... Attila, he comes up with also convenient justification to just invade Roman territory, right? 
Yeah, it wasn't just the Visigoths. It was uh, in the aforementioned Valentian the Third. He was a boy emperor. Um, his he had a sister named Honoria, and it is said that Honoria had sent a ring uh, and a letter to Attila asking for asking to be wed. Right, and you know it. Attila Attila decided, hey, you know what? This is obviously a proposal, and now as my dowry, I want half of the Western Roman Empire. And again, this is just Attila with his far out, like, this is like me going to Riley's house and like, I don't know, man, like, I steal his car and I break it. And then I'm like, bro, you need to pay me for this. And he's like, what are you talking about? You just broke my car. And I'm like, remember that one time I lent you five bucks when we went to the movie? Like, <laughs> it's like, yeah, it's like exactly. just, you're just pulling, you're just pulling things out of the ether and just coming up with justifications. And it's supposedly Honoria's uh, intent was to utilize Attila, Attila as um, an honorary magister militum, which in Latin means supreme commander of the military uh, for leverage. So maybe she wanted to supplant Valentia III because she was unhappy that she was being wed off to some dumb aristocrat that she didn't care for. Um, and this was not uncommon for not uncommon for ambitious Roman women to try to do, but Attila wasn't a pawn. Um, I, I would be, when I, when I read things like these, like I, I kind of, I'm like, yeah, okay, could be, makes sense. But a lot of historians, especially around Rome, like when things go wrong, they're like, they, they blame the women. They blame the powerful women. They're like, oh, she was plotting. Oh, she was trying to seize power for her son. Like it's, it always comes back to some weird plotting uh, machination from a queen or a queen's sister or something like that. So like, it's very likely that this did occur, but I'd also take it with a, a grain of salt. That, not that the, the ring wasn't sent. It's very likely that she sent the ring um, and said, hey, marry me because I want to get out of this bad marriage, which may have just her been being absolutely stupid and privileged. Um, but the whole like, now marry me so we can supplant Valentian and we can rule together. Like that's, that's when that little Roman twist gets put on it where they tend to view women in a pretty uh, sinister way. Yeah, I mean, I would say that it's definitely a stretch that Attila thought that that this proposal was so set in stone and so valuable that it was again the romans violating the treaty against him i think that he was like sick check yeah. please i'm <laughs> bored you know what i mean here, here here's a great opportunity for me to invade again and that's exactly what he does right he invades he invades the roman empire and this time he invades the west and he has this it's said that he had half a million soldiers with him now the more realistic number could be 30 to 40,000 you might push it to 150,000 if you want to be a bit more extra on, on the big side yeah 500,000 absolutely not he did not have 500,000 but he he has enough that he's quickly slaughtering and destroying many cities on his way and something we touched on especially in the last episode is the western roman empire especially modern day france is barely roman now it's it's Roman, but the people living there are usually not Romans, and there's there's many there's many smaller budding kingdoms within the Roman Empire. Remember the Attila's Great Migration. Attacking. Yeah, remember the Great Migration. So all these Gothic barbarian tribes that are living within Rome at the time, and Rome has said that oh this is our territory, but it's your territory. But they never show up. It's really it's really these Gothic people's territories. Now Attila's invading all of them. He's attacking all of them in reality. So what happens? Well, uh, the Romans allied themselves with their previous enemies. Um, it, it, previous enemies meaning like they, they've, it's an interesting element of this story, right? Because all of these people, um, and we don't want to overlook this, like the Goths, the Romans, the Alans, the Franks, uh, many more, they had been fighting amongst each other like time immemorial as long as they've been around right like these are the these are the these are the like the um the predecessors of the people that Julius Caesar was fighting in his Gallic campaigns right and the Germanic tribes that he crossed the crossed the river and went and slapped around right like these are these are those people so they've been fighting for hundreds of years but simply the presence of Attila makes them all like, hey man, maybe we should put these sticks down and like deal with this guy because, you know, he's he's about to he's about to mess us up, right? And that's exactly what they did. Um at this uh and this this leads to what many would consider uh the pinnacle of the pinnacle of war, the apex of the military like the the, the fighting with Attila. This was probably the largest scale battle that uh, Attila was involved in with the Romans and this coalition. Uh, and so Prior to this taking place, right, this 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 battle occurring, uh, Attila had marched through all of Gaul, as Riley said, ransacking the cities, taking people down to Aurelian 
oh, God, I cannot pronounce this. Aurelianum, Aurelianum. That's how I'm going to say it, which is modern day. Uh, I, I don't speak. Orléans. Or, yeah, there you go, my man. In France. Um, and this was this and this city, uh, Riley, this city. Uh, yeah, so the city. Or, or uh, uh, come on, this city. Oh, Orléans, French, yeah. <laughs> was promised by the king of the Allens, uh, Sangaban, um, that the gates would be opened, allowing him entrance. And bear in mind, like, this dude's probably just terrified of Attila and be like, hey, man, yeah, we're with you, bro. Like, yeah, all good, man. The gates are open. It's all yours, right? But the people living in the city are like, what are you talking about, dude? He's going to slaughter us. This is our home, right? So he. He marched towards uh, Aurelianum. I'm not going to make Riley keep speaking French. Uh, but the, the Allen citizenry kept the gates closed. And in a, a fortuitous turn of fate, there was four days of heavy rainfall. And the siege from the Huns was repelled, largely due part to the, the defense of the city by the citizenry. Um, and at this time, the Romans were, they had assembled a coalition army and they were marching into Gaul. Um, the Romans reached the city on June 14th of 451 AD. And it's it's important that they arrived when they did, because at the point it, that they did, the, the Huns had already broken through into the city. Not fully fledged, right? Because bear in mind, a lot of ancient city. It wasn't just like, it wasn't like a... A, uh, a noble's like a noble's little village where there was just some castle walls and then you walk in and there's the courtyard right there was multiple different levels of defenses and they were there was fighting in the city but once the huns saw that the romans were coming well now they were vulnerable of being flanked so they withdrew from the city uh, and it's important that the romans arrived when they did because had the gates been closed it would have been very problematic for um this coalition to deal with Attila because, you know, a quickly assembled army, an army uh, that's, you know, the, the, the most important element is haste, might not have the logistical capabilities for a siege, and this might have allowed Attila free reign in Gaul longer. Uh, and one last thing that is actually remarkable about this coalition that needs to be said, it was actually close to not being assembled. assembled. So do you remember how I mentioned uh, Praetorian Prefect Constantius in the east? Well, the Praetorian Prefect, prior Praetorian Prefect in the west uh, for Gaul, was, uh, this is his last name, was Avidus. And Avidus, he... He, he basically, he was a personal friend of Theodoric, and Theodoric was the king of the Visigoths, which you could argue was probably the most, I'd say, right, he's probably the most formidable of the, the coalition members, right? Like the Goths at this point, like, they were probably the, the Romans' biggest enemy, I'd say. Theodoric? Uh, yeah, like the Visigoths, right? For sure. Yeah. For so, sure. So, yeah. and fortunately, Avidus, during his reign as the Praetorian Prefect, he had made a positive relationship with Theodoric. Uh, and Theodoric and all of these people... Um, who were fighting in this coalition, as I said earlier, they were federati. So they were allies of Rome. Uh, so it makes sense why he could have had a relationship because it was a different group that were Goths, but also Roman, settled in Roman territory that were pledged to Rome. But um, prior to this actually occurring, Aetius and Theodoric actually in the 430s, they were warring with each other, right? So Theodoric and Aetius didn't like each other much, but Avidus had a very good relationship with Theodoric and convinced him and said, hey, we're going to get slapped if you don't come and help us fight here. And then you're going to get slapped and then we're all going to get slapped. Um, so that's just a, that's, that's an incredible little moment in history that a lot of people don't really I don't want to say a lot of people because I don't know how many people actually follow history. But in my experience reading history, a lot of things either succeed or fail based upon the relationships you have with the people you're dealing with, right? And a another remarkable thing I just need to say it again is these people were fighting. Like while the Romans in the East were fighting the Huns, the, the Romans in the West were fighting these people that they were now standing beside to fight the Huns, right? So that's how terrifying Attila was to these people. Absolutely. You know, and... There's realistically multiple different tellings of the battle itself, but I'm going to tell one that is... This is the human history's version of the battle. Yeah, well, this is actually this is a likely version of what happened. But the human history's now, version. Definitely the human history's <laughs> version. So Attila, he has mounted... He has a lot of, of mounted cavalry units, and especially archer cavalry. So as he's pulling back from the city, Attila is deciding where he wants the battle to take place. And what he's doing is he would leave sort of a small contingent of horse archery to delay. And this is what's crazy about this battle and the way I'm going to paint it out. The tactics used in this battle are almost identical to the tactics used today. Like the same. It's crazy how little war has changed, how little tactics have changed. So he's doing what's called a delay. We still call this a delay where he would leave some horse archery. And then the, those horse cavalry, sorry, those cavalry archers would 
force the Romans to deploy a defensive to fight them for, you know, however long, and then they would pull back. And they would just do this along the way while Aetius is chasing the Huns. And so Aetius chases the Huns for like six days until Attila decides on a battleground. We don't actually know where the battleground was. We do know that, well, we do assume that there was a very large ridge to the right and there was a large forest to the left of the battleground. So if you don't know, modern, sorry, normal military tactics, you would place your cavalry on the flanks because you need your flanks to be defended. However, because of the geography of the landscape, the Romans didn't need to put their cavalry on the flanks because their flanks were protected by a forest and a ridge. So what they did do is they left the Visigoth, a Visigoth contingent of cavalry up on top of, sorry, up just behind the ridge so that the Huns couldn't see them. And the Huns, and then they had both on the right and the left, they had the Visigoths on the right, and then on the left, they had the Romans. And in the middle, they had Allen cavalry. And if you don't know who we're talking about, last episode is great to go back and, and figure this out, but this is the different parts of the coalition. And this is why the Visigoths are such an important factor at this battle. One of the suspected reasons they had the Allens in the middle, um, and they, this happens all throughout ancient warfare, you'll see in like a Greek phalanx, they'll be the most experienced men at the front and at the back, and they'll put the people who they think are most likely to run in the center. That way there's nowhere for them to go. And that was kind of the situation with the Allens. If you remember, the leader of the Allens, Sangaban, had promised to open the city to... Uh, to Attila, so they're they're the, the Allen citizenry were pretty legit, but you know their their leadership they they were they were questionable. So that they had placed them in a position where, like, listen, you guys are getting hammered first, and there's no run in here, right? Yeah. So they have their they have their shield walls, and then they have a line of missile units. So whether this was um, javelin throwers or archers, and then they have what's called they have another reserve of cavalry. So the reason they use cavalry in a reserve is obviously cavalry are much more mobile and they can get to different parts of the battle. The way you use a reserve is if your left side's getting destroyed, you can put the reserve to the left. It, it's a way to be more mobile mid battle, which is really difficult. So what happens is the Huns attack the center and they route the Allen cavalry. Like Alan Ashton was saying, the Allens were not exactly the most motivated soldiers of this battle. And they rout the Allen cavalry. Now the Roman center is open and Attila pulls his horsemen back and then he runs them along the, the lines of Roman and Visigoth soldiers and they shoot their arrows. But they actually lose quite a few soldiers doing this because the shield walls are up, the Huns don't do much damage, but the archers from behind the Romans and the Visigoths actually do kill quite a few of the Hun cavalry. So Attila circles his cavalry back, gets more troops, advances all of his troops along the two front lines of the Romans and the Visigoths, and then he attacks the Visigoths through the open center with his cavalry. Now, the reserve cavalry that Aetius has... Is it Aetius? Aetius. Yeah, Aetius has. The reserve cavalry he has, he uses them to sort of get the Allens under control again, and he attacks the center that has now been exposed. This is when King Theodoric dies. It's when King Theodoric's men are being flanked by Hun cavalry that and attacked from the front by Hun infantry that he gets killed. Now remember earlier I talked about a smaller contingent of cavalry hidden behind this ridgeline, this very important ridgeline. This is King Theodoric's son. Now I'm telling this story and it is a bit dramatized. We don't know if, if Theodoric's son heard about this. All we do know is that he comes down from the ridgeline, flanks the Huns who don't see this cavalry unit that's been hiding behind the ridgeline, and just smokes them along in front of the Visigoth frontier. So this is a way, and this is an example of the story that could explain how the Huns were defeated this day. But what's important is the Romans and their coalition defeat the Huns, which is crazy. Yeah, and it, it just for if reference, if anybody wants to know, it's it's speculated that the battle took place June twentieth, fought four fifty one A.D. Some people say it happened in July or as far off as September twenty seventh, but you know that's not important. But what is important is that the Romans and the Goths are suspected to have won, but it was not a win without death. And the uh, Jord Jordanes, uh, Jordanus, 
Jordans, I don't know, a contemporary historian at the time estimated that uh, the number of dead from this battle was about 165,000, which, you know, considering if the Huns themselves had a hundred and something thousand plus and the Romans themselves, the Roman, this is actually an interesting point about, remember, I remember how I mentioned Federati, majority of the battle was fought by Federati. So there was, there was a, like, at this point, the Roman Empire, like the Romans were, they were leading the charge, but they wasn't, there wasn't nearly as many of them as there were the people that they were paying to fight for them, right? Their allies. Um, anyway, so the, the suspected debt is 165,000 and other sources report from, you know, 300,000 to 350,000, but you know, these numbers are disagreed upon by many historians. And we, we know that like historians, especially contemporary historians, especially if the people writing the history or people who were at the battle like to portray immense numbers, uh, depending on whether they were victor or defeated, actually both often, um, it serves to mold history, right? Like look at Julius Caesar, like he might he might battle like ten thousand Gauls, and he'd be like, and a million Gauls came swarming down the hill at me and three of my friends. Like, <laughs> like yeah, he wants to. They, they want to make themselves sound badass, right? But it's unlikely that it was that high. But there was definitely an incredible death toll. And as Riley alluded to, King Theodoric was one of the men who was cut down in the battle. Uh, and yeah, so now we're left with the aftermath and the following day of the battle. Uh, the coalition forces, they, they'd placed Attila's camp under siege as they deliberated, uh, deliberated on what were the next steps. And you might ask, well, how can they siege a camp? Well, wagon trains, right? So what they would do is they'd make a large circle and then a circle and then a circle of wagons, so essentially makeshift walls that you don't really need trebuchets to break through. Um, and yeah, they, while they were sieging this camp, they were thinking, okay, well, what do we do next? And it's said that Aetius, uh, during these deliberations, he convinced Thorismund, uh, man, I love these. I love the names of the, the Visigoths, dude. Like that's dude. They the, sound, they're so badass. The, the Visigoths are studs. Hundred percent. Yeah. Uh, so Thorismund, he was the son of King Theodoric, the one that routed the uh, uh, the Hunnic the Hunnic cavalry, right? It was the cavalry. So he just the Huns. No, he, 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 according to Jordanus's portrayal of the battle, it was Thorismund who has delivered the final blow. Okay. It could very well be storytelling, like his father fell and he oh. he ran the day, right? Like, <laughs> Absolutely, like literally, none of that could have happened. Yeah. It could have been completely different, but there's no way of actually knowing because it's so far, it's so long ago. Like, there's no way we really know. It's all theory, exactly. All history is theory. But yeah, the, the son of King Theodoric, uh, who is now King Thorismund, uh, he was urged by Aetius to return home uh, to the Goths and the Franks that were fighting in the battle. They they they're kind of a smaller po- picture, but. They were returned to. They were urged to go back to their home as well because they were actually fighting a civil war in the battle. There was a coalition of Franks on the Hunnic side and on the Roman side. So they were like, he was like, "Hey, Goths, get out of here! Um, hey, Franks, get out of here!" Basically, sending everybody back to where they were going. And the retreat for King Thorismund is actually uh, it's well advised, but you you have to wonder if Etius has um, secondary motive. But the reason it was well advised is because. Uh, Theodoric had sons, right? Many sons. And as we saw with Bleda, uh, it was a bit of a cutthroat world and people like to assume that there would be a usurper, right? Kill kill your brother, kill this person, kill that person. Now you take power for yourself. Because life wasn't like it was nowadays back then and life was hard. And if you could be the, the big honcho man in charge, life was pretty good, right? Um, or life was how it was nowadays because this is still happening to this day. True, true. <laughs> you go go to less developed parts of the, of the world and... Yeah, people are usurping people for power all the no, time. You're right. But yeah, some some historians, um, and this actually, personally, I think this makes very good sense. Uh, some people argue that the reason Aetius was so uh, hasty to tell everybody to vacate the battlefield, all of his allies, is because, remember, the Huns, like, the, the Romans had used the Huns to fight these people, and the Romans themselves were fighting these people. So now, when there's... You know, when there's the Goths here that you were just fighting 10 years prior, and then there's the Franks here who you were just fighting 10 years prior, and there are the Huns who you were just fighting and who you also paid to fight these people. If you're the Romans, you're kind of in a situation where, hey, like I have all these tenuous allies around me who maybe one of them slips an emissary through to the Hunnic camp, and now there's an agreement, and now they're going to turn against me and crush me right here, right? So there's the possibility that all the people who just helped me beat Attila might side with Attila and now destroy me. Um, well, Attila, in my interpretation of it uh, and Aetius's sort of mindset here is the Huns are a great equalizer and as we've seen right now is the Huns will bring all these people together and maybe he's hoping that this proves to the other Goths and Visigoths and and Alans it proves to them that they need 
him and the Romans. Maybe that's what he's hoping. But I think that what he realizes too is the enemy of my enemy is my friend. So it's as likely, and in fact, we'll see further in history, but it's as likely that Aetius and his Roman buddies get destroyed by the Huns if the Huns come back, as it is that they get destroyed by the Visigoths if the Huns don't come back. So it's definitely a very intricate political game that Aetius might be playing here, because it's assumed that they probably could have come in and destroyed Attila's camp. It's not We're not positive that they could have, uh, judging by how many troops they had left, but I think that I think that Aetius is playing a very balanced political game here. I think he's he's making his decisions because he's proven that he's pretty pretty nifty when it comes to this stuff. So I think that there was definitely some extra reason for him not attacking Attila here. Yeah, I suppose right because if you have like you could look at it from one perspective, like I need to get these guys off the battlefield so that Attila they can't side with Attila and crush me. But you could also look at it from the perspective of I don't want the Huns crushed because I need to pay them if these dudes try to crush me 10 years down the line and I need Attila around, right? And that's that's exactly what happened. Attila, he was able to retreat. He, he didn't win the day he lost, but that stopped his... He lost, right? Both sides kind of lost a lot. But uh, that stopped his advance into Gaul and he returned back to home base. But, you know, the ever restless Attila, um, he didn't wait too long to come back. Less than a year later, after the Battle of Chalon, the Huns returned, and this time they set their sights directly on Rome. They set their sights directly on Italy. And the first city they hit is Aquileia, which was this really famous city that the Romans had used to defend themselves from anywhere coming from the east. And he just completely raises it to the ground. Attila absolutely decimates the city. And then they invade Venetia and they pillage and plunder some settlements. And this is actually kind of cool because this event leads to Venice being created because the refugees fleeing Aquileia and fleeing the Venetian area, they settle in the lagoon that surrounds modern day Venice. And they use this to protect themselves against the Hunnic horsemen because the horses can't really sort of wade into this, this lagoon. And so that's pretty cool because Venice becomes eventually a super unbelievably important city-state. So Attila is just, he comes back and he almost, the Romans have nothing left. They don't have the coalition to call onto and the Huns are just obliterating them. Because the coalition only really came to Rome's aid because Attila was attacking Gaul, which was not really where the Romans lived. It was more where the Visigoths and the Al- it was where all of the, the Gothic people lived. So now when, when Attila is attacking Italy, they don't care. They're not invested in Rome at all. So th- this this time he's he's definitely on his own. Aetius is definitely on his own. Yeah, and it, at this point in history, like after the uh, the Battle of the Catalonian Plains or the Battle of Chalons, as you know, that's my attempt at French. Um, after that battle occurred, there wasn't... That was kind of the uh, the high note, like we said, the pinnacle of uh, Attila's war, because that that was that was an invasion, that was war fighting. Uh, what occurred after in Italy was essentially just sacking, right? And it got to the point where he had defeated Rome. He, he realized that they were they were done for, and Rome then sent Pope Leo the first to meet him, and you know. Is you know revisionist history. The Romans credit the the Pope with turning back the Huns. Like, By the power of Christ compels you, right? <laughs> <laughs> what what in reality, what's most likely is uh, like we had mentioned prior in the East and in the West as well. There was plague, right? There was plague and famine, and all of these things occurring um, in the world at this time. So it's likely that the Huns said, you know what, man, like we're not getting much out of here. My people are sick. You guys are really sick. Like I've already gotten what I want. You guys are all kind of. Like, I just burnt down Aquileia and half of your other cities. I'm going back to home base, right? I'm going to go have some R&R. Yeah, and a point to, to mention there, too, is the Western Roman Empire fell 20 years after this invasion. Yeah. Not even. I think it was like 21 years. 476 so, AD. Exactly. So when Attila's invading Italy, unlike when he was invading the Balkans and invading the Eastern Roman Empire, the Vandals have captured North Africa, which is... Italy's main source of food and important supplies. So while Attila's raiding Italy, he's not actually getting much because the people he's raiding barely have anything for themselves. Rome is is crumbling. 20 years is no amount of time. So Rome is already crumbling. So not only are his people getting sick 
from from disease. His soldiers are not having enough food to eat. They're really not getting much money out of this invasion. He's already obliterated Aquileia. He he has he's winning everywhere. He's almost completely unchallenged. And then Pope Leo shows up with a big cart of gold and says, please go away. For the love of God, get out of here. And Attila's like, okay, dude, whatever. You're right. I won. You know, and to to go back and say that Pope Leo comes out and just like magically convinces Attila the freaking Hun to go away on his own is a bit ridiculous. I think that it's much easier to assume that there was a lot of factors going into why Attila decides to leave, but that's what he does. He decides to go back and kick it, you know, and he he decides to finally, after, you know, years of invading now, he's been on the warpath for pretty much a, a 18, couple of years on end. 18 years. Yeah. yeah. So I think he decides to go back and just post up for a couple of years. And that's what he does. And he just goes back and starts hanging out. He takes yet another bride. And uh, this is sort of where the story winds down. Yeah, this was this was in 453 that he left Italy and, like Riley said, gets married. Um, and this, that's, hey, you guys made it to basically the end. There's not much else to say. He was, uh, while celebrating the new marriage that he had just christened, I suppose, um, it's suspected that he had choked to death on his own blood. Uh, and, and naturally, the details of what happened are unknown. And <laughs> I'm sure he gets tired of it, but, you know, left to speculation due to history. Um However, it is thought that he died uh, lying on his back. Uh, he could have been murdered by uh, the, the woman who he had married or had a burst blood vessel, or it could have been internal bleeding caused by excessive drinking. Uh, and we mentioned this in the last episode, actually, that uh, the Huns hadn't had a taste of Roman wine until they got into Rome. And once they had a taste for it, that taste, you know, never went away. So it could have been that potentially. Um, they have actually, like, I, I find the Huns have really interesting traditions, the way they, like, they... They bury their chieftains, right? Their leaders, the respect they show to them. It kind of, it kind of blows me away. Like the, the, especially the secrecy with the way they're buried. And they're not just like, they're not buried just like, you know, it's not like throw some, throw them in a casket, throw some dirt on it. It's, uh, they put them into three different coffins. Yeah. They put them into a, they put them into a gold coffin and then they put a bigger silver coffin around the gold coffin. And then they put an even bigger iron coffin around both of those coffins. And it's cool, you know, when Attila dies, however he dies, all the Hunnic warriors cut their hair and slice their faces to honor his death. He was the ultimate warrior to them. He was the great leader. And I think that that is a good way to end because it does paint a different picture of Attila. You know, if you look at how the Huns treated him compared to how he's written about, it's very dramatically different. And I think that that's a great example of Attila being a good leader. At the end of the day, if we're looking at it, if we're removing morality, if we're removing any opinions on invasion and destroying things and pillaging cities, if we're looking at it strictly from the sense of who was Attila to the Huns, Attila to the Huns was a great leader. He was a great tactician he was a great military leader he brought them to them as a warrior people he brought them the utmost glory respect and glory right so they bury him in a way that according to hunnic tradition they take a bunch of slaves and they dig a big hole they bury it in a river and then they they diverted a river to bury him in the riverbed yeah we can't know that though because we don't know where the freaking pretty damn cool (laughs) burial site is but yeah it's pretty cool and then they kill all the slaves that buried him to hide his location forever and they successfully did and we've never found where attila the huns buried so it's pretty amazing to end on that note yeah and within 15 short years in 468 the hunnic empire that attila had amassed was fractured splintered it was on the decline uh, it was never the same his children tried to maintain it but they were not the men that attila was so uh like riley said attila he uh, he personified kind of what it meant to be a hun he was the best of them and the huns they, they came on strong like a whirlwind and as fast as they arrived they exited the scene um i suppose you could say uh that the candle that burns twice as bright lasts half as long and that's it that's a tale of the thanks for listening thanks for listening to the human histories i'm riley osborne with your 
host Ashton Myers. If you want to listen to a couple more ways to support the podcast, um, a way that we would really appreciate is through subscription for ad-free episodes at our Patreon. We also offer the transcripts of all the writing we did. You know, this one was eight pages again. No, this one was 10 pages. Almost 11. So, yeah. yeah, So that's a great way to get more information and show how we do this. We also answer any questions there. And it's just a great way for us to be able to reinvest a bit more into the podcast. We also want you guys to email us at humanhistoriespodcast at gmail.com just to be part of the community, to ask questions, tell us about stuff we missed, tell us about things that we got wrong. We're here to learn, man, and we we want to be getting better as we do this podcast, and we want to be learning more as we do it. You know, that's why we're motivated to keep doing this thing. So we hope you enjoyed it, and we hope you come back and listen to the next one. I'm good, man. All right. You want to end it there? Yeah, I'm Ashton Myers. You guys have been listening to Human Histories. Um, Thank you for listening. We hope you enjoyed the show. Take it easy.